what I want to share with you this morning, just to kind of set the stage for this session, actually this afternoon, um, looking specifically at SDGs 6 and 14, um, and looking at them sort of in a looking backward context about where we are and, and what it took to get where we are on each of these SDGs, uh, touching in particular on the MDGs, the predecessors to the SDGs, and then looking at the, the real question, the future. Wh how, where, are, where do we need to get by 2030, or in some, many cases 2020, and how can we get there? And you'll see it's largely SDG by the numbers. It's about you know, looking at the SDG targets and what they, they imply in effect for how to get from A to B. And you'll see it's quite a daunting challenge, but an important one. And so I sprinkle the presentation with where and how the GF can, and in many ways already is, playing a role towards delivery of these SDGs. Okay, starting from the top, 6.1, of course, is universal access to water. Uh, and so the MDG period, over that period, on average, 104 million people per year gained access to water, uh, and the MDG was achieved at a global level. 91% of people now have access to an improved water source versus the target of 88%. So we have a gap still of about 660 million to get access to. The rate we'd need to uh, uh, continue is, is much lower, 44 million year per year, but the, the underside of that story is much of the gains in the MDGs occurred in urban areas, and there's still quite large gaps in many rural areas. And of course, the whole concept of the last mile problem, getting access to water to people in the most rural and remote areas. The GF, of course, is not in the provision of water supply business, but the GF does quite a bit, as you know, with protecting the upstream waters that often serve as drinking water supply. So the GF has a critical role in sort of an indirect sense of supporting SDG 6.1. 6.2, by 2030, universal access to sanitation and ending open defecation. The MDG, we averaged 84 million per year were given access to sanitation. With that even, we missed it by 700 million people. Now only still 68% versus a target of 77% have access to sanitation. The result, two and a half billion people still lack access. That's almost one in every three on Earth. We need a rate of 160 million per year. That's double the MDG rate to achieve that MDG, SDG by 2030. The GF obviously not in the major business of sanitation supply, but in some instances, particularly in SIDS, uh, has played an important role, for example, in, in piloting and scaling up eco-sanitation solutions and approaches to, to sanitation. Okay, by uh, 6.3, by 2030, uh, the target is to have the proportion of people, uh, have the proportion of untreated wastewater. Right now, I did a quick estimate, about 2.5 billion, about 35% of the world population, have their wastewater collected and treated. Having that, it's the same concept as the MDG, having that means moving to 67.5%, that means bringing wastewater treatment to an additional 2.32 billion people. That's 154 million per year. That's a target. Okay, by uh, 6.4, by 2030, we have sustainable withdrawals of water from both surface and groundwater, and we substantially reduce the number of people facing water scarcity. Also a big challenge. In the 20th century, water use, water withdrawals grew twi almost twice as fast as population. In 2005, S FAO already estimated uh, 1 billion people were facing water stress or scarcity. In the business as usual scenarios of no change, we would see as many as 3.6 billion by 2025 facing water stress or security. So uh, it's very obvious, to, to get this SDG, we need to slow, reverse, and, and substantially change these, these trends. So it's, 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 everyone knows the answer. We need a, we need a revolution in, in the use of water, in the efficiency, in scaling up an application of integrated water resources management. And it's really the same concept as we're starting to see quite positively in the energy sector, a decoupling of energy use and economic development population growth. We need to see that in water too. We need that growth, we need that uh, poverty reduction without dramatically increasing our water use. Okay, 6.5, uh, whoops, sorry. 6.5 by 2030, implementing integrated water resources manage management at all levels, including at the transboundary level. So you've seen many great presentations this week, the results of the TWAP, 
uh, the number of transboundary rivers, lakes, aquifers. We know that in the last six, 70 years or so, over 295 international water agreements have been negotiated uh, and signed in that period. We have the new, or the fairly new, UN Convention on Water Courses. We have the UNECE Convention also in force and expanded to a global basis. Uh, and nevertheless, with all that important progress at various levels, the Oregon State University Transboundary Waters Program, they estimated in 2008 that about 158 of the world's shared basins do not have any kind of cooperative framework. So, you know, if you accept the simple premise that, you know, at least a basic framework for multi-country cooperation is, is, is necessary to implement IWRM at a transboundary scale, in a perfect world, we need to be striving to have every major transboundary basin under some kind of framework by 2030. So if you do a very simple back of the envelope calculation, that means adding about 10 new basins per year through 2030 to this sort of family of frameworks. Now looking at IWRM more at the, no at the, at the national and local levels, um, my colleague Joachim Harlan chaired a, a UN Water Task Force several years ago that looked extensively at the global progress on, on IWRM, mainly at the national level, uh, as, as part of the targets that came out of WSSD. And you can see some of the numbers here on, on generally good progress on implementing uh, IWRM, on developing IWRM plans, on including IWRM in their national plans. But even so, in many countries, particularly low and medium HDI countries, the progress has even slowed or reversed. Uh, there's some positive trends in overall financing for water resources, but little really legitimate progress in building in payment for, for water and ecosystem services for that matter. Um, not surprisingly, the countries that are adopting and implementing IWRM are showing much better progress on water infrastructure development. And then lastly, no surprise either, there's a strong linkage between creating of IWRM, uh, enabling environment, and positive and improved water management. So what's the future if we're going to move on this, on this SDG? IWRM needs to be integrated into national uh, planning and development processes. Uh, IWRM even more important because, of course, the new driver of climate change and how it, in fact, impacts the water cycle. Um, we need to continue support to strengthen institutional frameworks for IWRM, especially in low-income countries. We need to dramatically increase our investments in water use efficiency uh, across the board. We need capacity building at all levels. Even in the more wealthy countries, there's needs to improve IWRM capacity. So GF has an important role here. Obviously, we're working mainly at the transboundary level uh, through our IW and TDA SAP programs and so forth. But many of the SAPs deliver subsidiary national action plans, which have close linkages to national IWRM uh, planning processes. So those are very important. And of course, at the level of SIDS, we don't need to be on a transboundary scale. We are supporting, in effect, all the SIDS of the world through a series of GEF projects in IWRM and planning and linking to integrated coastal management uh, as well. Okay, moving to the Oceans SDG 14. Uh, first one, 14.1, uh, by 2025, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution, especially from marine debris uh, and nutrients. Looking first at the nutrients, the nitrogen loads from the continents to the oceans have basically tripled from their pre-industrial levels. Uh, obviously, it's fertilizer runoff, manure, wastewater, untreated wastewater. And this has led, as we, many of you know, to a pretty much geometric increase in these hypoxic zones. The UNEP's last estimate, well over 500 of these around the world. The economic damage as high as $800 billion per year of hypoxia on, on, on human uh, economies. So, you know, the G GPNM and the other great um, Jeff su supported um, nitrogen and nutrient management programs, we, we know we need re really transformational changes in how, in the nitrogen economy, literally, in, in policy, in inc improving economic incentives and so forth for managing nitrogen and phosphorus uh, better. Um, then Jeff has, has been and continues to be very well positioned in this area to support through TDA SAP processes, through ICM, through IWRM, all these uh, strategies and methodologies, uh, continued uh, progress and efforts in, in reduction of nitrogen pollution. Plastics, the world now is estimated to produce 300 million metric tons of plastics per year. That's about, yeah, sorry, the recycling rate, I did a rough calculation based on major economies of the world. Global recycling rate of plastics around 24%. Good, but obviously much more needs to be done. And so anyway, we're seeing on the order of eight to 20 million metric tons of plastic getting into the ocean every year. And some estimates that could 
uh, go up by tenfold as early as 2025 because of recent and current trends. UNEP in 2014 estimated the global damage to, to marine ecosystems from marine debris, marine plastic, 13 billion uh, per year. So what do we need to do? Well, you know, I'm sure many of you have been exposed to and learned of, of effective strategies for reducing plastics pollution, things like banning plastic bags or putting price, you know, putting a price tag on them, recycling programs, obviously reuse programs. So they're all out there. The, the examples are all out there, but they're very sporadic and they're not systematic. So they need to obviously be replicated and scaled up in a quite, quite serious way. Um, GF Stapp on two occasions has, has written about marine debris and confirmed it's a global environmental issue in both the biodiversity and the international waters context. So in my personal view, uh, you know, marine debris, number one, is a transboundary issue, both at the river basin level and, of course, at the ocean level. And so I think it's time that Jeff International Waters going forward, and Jeff Seven certainly, needs to formally in integrate marine debris into its policy and programming. Uh, and of course, through that, we would incorporate assessment and addressing of marine debris issues in our TDA SAPs, in our IWRMs, and our ICMs, and so forth. Is this fast enough for you? <laughs> Rest assured, the ridiculous amount of detail and data in this will be posted on the IWC8 uh, website later, so you can scrutinize it in more detail. 14.3 uh, is the huge issue of minimizing and addressing, I should say that, interesting, addressing ocean acidification. 30% uh, of all the anthropogenic CO2 that we emit every year into the atmosphere dissolves into the ocean, forms um, bicarbonate, and ultimately lowers the pH of the ocean already, just today, the global ocean pH has dropped about 0.1 pH units. Don't forget pH is a logarithmic scale, so that's a big deal. This increased acidity presents many of the organisms that form calcium carbonate for their skeletons and their shells, plankton right up to, to mollusks, uh, from producing those shells. And it can have massive reverberations and impacts throughout the marine ecosystems and several ecosystems, particularly in the polar regions where it's colder. CO2 dissolves faster, no big surprise. They're already showing impacts from ocean acidification. So if you look at the business as usual, you know, bad scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions, no, no real action, ocean pH would to continue to decline to probably 0.3 to 0.4, by another 0.3 to 0.4 units, leading to almost certain sizable deterioration across all marine ecosystems. Uh, Brander in 2011 estimated, and this is a low estimate, I think, at this point, a $1.2 trillion socioeconomic cost of no action on ocean acidification. Now, the good news is we have, of course, the Paris Agreement, which agreed to aggressive time frames and, and reductions, of course, in greenhouse gas emissions. If we achieve Paris, we, in effect, achieve slowing and even possibly reversing ocean acidification. They're directly correlated because they're both about CO2. Um, GF is already taking action. We're working with the shipping center, sector through IMO on something called GLOMEEP, which is helping ships improve their energy efficiency. Um, and we have a sister project self supporting the aviation industry on reducing its carbon footprint. Uh, in fact, if you really think about it, look at it, every single Jeff climate change mitigation project ever approved or implemented is supporting reversing and reducing ocean acidification because it reduces the CO2 burden. So that's, that's good news. Okay, 14.4 by 2020 and uh, IUU and overfishing. We know about 30% of fish stocks are overexploited. IUU affects about 20% of global stocks, costing us or worth about 23 billion a year. And of course, no surprise, there's a very strong relationship between IUU and overfishing and weak fisheries governance. So again, if you just take the raw numbers at face value, you want to get from 30% to zero, you've got to do about 6% per year reduction in the you know, fraction of, of fish stocks that are unsustainable. Same with IUU, 20%, five years, 4% per year to get there, big challenge. And of course the GF already does and will continue to have a very important role in addressing this issue through its support to regional fisheries organizations, uh, through the LME programs, through national and even local, very good work by SGB on reforming fishing at all levels for, for sustainable use. Uh, and just to, to, to illustrate the close connection to the GF, the GF6 has a corporate target in IW of, of helping or assisting uh, to uh, reduce 20% of the overall unexploited fisheries burden um, toward more sustainable practice, which is good. Okay, 14.5 uh, is by 2020, conserve at least 10% of all coastal and marine areas on Earth. Now, if you break that up a little bit, already we're at 8.4% of EEZs um, that are under 
some kind of MPA. And the Aichi target is to achieve 10% of EEZs. And in fact, I've talked to people in CBD with some recent or in new expected declarations. It's a strong probability the Aichi for EEZs will be achieved in this calendar year, which is good news. But the SDG calls for 10% of the ocean under uh, MPA. Right now, we're at about 3.5%. On average, the last 10 years, we averaged about 0.26% of the ocean put under MPA. Good progress. And lastly, a very tiny proportion, 0.25% of the um, ABNJ is under any kind of formal protection. And as many of you know, the UN and the international community started negotiations this year on this possible implementing agreement to UNCLOS, which may, may have an impact in this area. So, if you do the raw numbers, to reach 10% of MPA of the oceans by 2020, we need to put in 1.3% of oceans per year, every year, uh, towards that. That's almost 5 million square kilometers per year designated. That would be five times the rate we achieved 2004 to 14. So big, big challenge. Um, and then, of course, you know, how quickly this ABNJ agreement process will go is, is highly uncertain, and it could be quite long. We just don't know. And so that suggests that we, we really, to achieve this, uh, this SDG target, we really need, need to continue the focus of, of our work on, AEZ, on uh, MPAs in, in EEZs. And then lastly, we did some analysis of some work, UNDP is working with the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance, uh, which has dedicated itself to working on 14.5. And in essence, Jeff has made, I would say, modest contributions to the global progress on, on uh, MPAs, and especially if you compare it to the Jeff investment in terrestrial protected areas, which has been quite substantial and quite, quite impactful. So I think there's an opportunity for the Jeff, and of course the Jeff meaning the countries, the beneficiaries, to really step up the effort and the focus on MPAs around the world. And then last but not least, many scientists, if you ask them, they say is 10% sufficient, and they say no. We need upwards of 30% or more of the oceans truly protected to achieve sustainable use. Okay, 14.6 by 2020 prohibit the destructive fish subsidies. It's estimated about $16 billion per year in uh, misinvestment, so we say, in destructive uh, fish, fish subsidies, 68% to, develop, to developed countries, 32% by developing countries. And so, again, if you take a very simplistic, we need to get from 16 to zero uh, in five years. It needs some very aggressive action and progress. This, of course, is mediated mainly through world trade organization processes that have really been underway since 2000. So obviously the action and the progress on that, that issue needs to step up significantly. 14.7, by 2030, uh, increase the economic benefits to SIDS and LDCs from marine resources. Uh, I'll focus only on SIDS in this case. The good news is SIDS um, have, you know, almost $2 billion in exports of fish products. It represents 7% of their exports, and it represents about 1.7% of their GDP. And it's increased a lot, about 50% uh, 2006 to 12. SIDS tourism exports, $24 billion per year, about 50% of all exports, and massive investments still occurring at this present time in, in hotel-related tourism, as much as a half a billion just in uh, 2012. But the fisheries and SIDS, um, are, are, are unfortunately subject to as many as 872 million in these negative subsidies, which obviously doesn't help. And so estimates are that about 60% of SIDS fish stocks in their EEZs are, are overfished. And that leads to a missed, you know, missed um, uh, realization of as much as 48% of the potential economic benefits of those, of those fisheries. So clearly we, Jeff and, and others, we need to assess, uh, help SIDS in developing and implementing their so-called blue economy strategies, which many are, uh, SIDS are doing that, to optimize their use and, and benefits from the ocean economy and to grow their, their economies. Jeff is extremely well positioned in this area. We have the work through the multifocal area ridge to reef programs. We have many LMEs that are involving the SIDS in their work. We have SIDS involved in a number of regional fisheries management organizations that Jeff supports. We have opportunities, of course, through biodiversity and MPA programming. And of course, um, increasingly important for SIDS, who are most um, uh, uh, affected by sea level rise, is support to their adaptation to improve their climate resilience. And then lastly, there may be opportunities, um, technology-wise and so forth, for uh, innovative, innovative approaches to getting energy from the oceans for SIDS and, and for others, for that matter. 14B is provide access for small-scale fisheries to marine resources and markets. Small-scale fisheries supply nearly half of the world's seafood supply, and they actually represent 90% or more, probably, of those actually employed in the sector. So they contribute far more to livelihoods, to jobs on a per 
ton of fish consumed uh, amount than, than, than um, large industrial fisheries. They also use only a quarter of the energy that industrial fisheries do to collect pretty much the same amount of fish. So they're much more energy efficient. But most s small scales are providing mainly raw product to both domestic and international markets. So they're not you know, reaping much of the benefit, as we know, in, in true value added. Uh, they're disadvantaged by much greater subsidies to large scale fisheries, the lack of use of co-management arrangements, lack of access to markets, even, even domestically, and the lack of their, their pricing power. So clearly there's opportunities to improve, improve their capacity with capacity building and financing. Governance need to enact legislation to give them, uh, given uh, wholesalers more incentive to purchase fish from SSF, uh, and the fish pricing, the whole pricing mechanisms and process needs to be much more transparent and accessible to them. The Jeff can support small scale fishers in this area. There's already several, I think, innovative new initiatives, the Coastal Fisheries Initiative, uh, the UNDP Jeff Marine Commodities Project, uh, some of the LMEs starting to examine and support this area of better access to, to small scale fishers. So, in sum, uh, I think this, this uh, review here underscores achieving the SDGs 6 and 14. It's an extremely ambitious and bold agenda. Uh, and in several cases, I think quite clearly it requires not just change, but transformational change in certain ocean and freshwater sectors and, and areas, and of course, in, in governance. Manolo, whoops, <laughs> Manolo said it best in his opening remarks our first day about the SDGs. He said, we need more, better, sooner. I couldn't have said it better, so that's why I quoted him. So brilliant, Manolo. So, and of course, my obvious underscoring message is the GF in the international waters, and really, of course, across the GF, um, can and really are quite clearly already does play a quite substantial role in supporting implementation of, of, of SDGs 6 and 14. So our work for the next 15 years, uh, those of us who are still in the, in the game, is to, is to you know, take these challenges and, and, and try to achieve them. Thank you.